Oh, would you like to stand for the reading of the gospel? <clears throat> I'm reading from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put your Lord, your God, to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Thanks be for the reading. I want to ask if you would just join me as I prayer before we move forward this morning. Heavenly Father, I pray that your words would be many, and my words would be few. If that's the result of my time being here this morning, then that will be a good thing. So Holy Spirit, just open our ears to hear and open our hearts that we might receive what you have for us, Lord, as we go into this event in the life of Christ and then lay this event over our lives today. Teach us, mold us, challenge us, do what, Lord, you need to do in us today. I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Oh, if you watch movies, if you're a big movie fan, I'm, I'm more of a music fan than a movie fan. My wife's kind of more of the movie person in the house. But if you watch enough films, like especially the action movies or the sci-fi, there's kind of this trend, there's kind of this pattern since they've been making films up until today. You know, the last half hour or so of the film, you can tell there's about to be this confrontation. Um, you've got your, your good guy, you know, your good people, and then you've got the bad guy. And as the film progresses, you're sitting there going, oh man, it's all going to come to a head here at the end. There's going to be a clash of the titans. Um, I grew up as a kid, you know, with Star Wars and lightsabers and Yoda and Wookiees and all that good stuff. Now, now <laughs> I'm going to say theologically, you know, yeah, George Lucas and what the scriptures teach aren't tracking whatsoever. But uh, I can remember the first Star Wars where Darth Vader takes on Obi-Wan Kenobi and, and Obi-Wan says, if you strike me down, I'll become even more powerful than ever. So duh, you know, Darth Vader, zit, and the robe falls to the floor. And then the Empire strikes back. It's Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker in the big epic battle at the end and Darth revealing that I am your father. And the confrontation continues. And, and good takes on evil. You see that, that pattern in films and that. The, the big showdown is going to take place. And the scripture passage that has been shared today, it's one that maybe we're very familiar with. Here's the problem with things that we're familiar with, especially when it comes to God's word. You, you kind of just get used to it. Um, and you get a little numb to maybe what it has to say. My hope is as we look into this passage, you know, I know that we're not looking at the first verse wondering, now I hope Jesus, you know, comes out in the end on top of this whole situation. We, we know the ending. We know how it's all going to shake down at the end. But what I want to focus on in the, in the time that I have here for the next few minutes is, again, not whether or not Jesus is going to come out a winner if he's going to pass the test. Instead, I want to focus on the nature of these temptations that Satan puts in front of him and how Jesus responds to these temptations. So then for us today, what do these temptations look like in our lives? Your real life today. And how do we respond? Because yes, there's going to be 
a test. No one in here, if you're God's child, gets to vote out of this. So some background. Uh, if you look at the third chapter of Matthew, before we get into the temptation episode, we have another guy who's out in this desert wilderness, John the Baptist. Funny man, wearing funny clothes, eating funny food, but making a very powerful statement. Get ready. Prepare yourselves. Someone's coming who's way more powerful than I am. Way more powerful than I am. He's coming. I'm letting you know. Be ready. Be ready. And Jesus comes into Galilee, but he comes to be baptized by this man, John. John says, no, wait, 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 wait. Shouldn't this be the other way around? Jesus says, no. This has to take place. This has to be taken care of. So John baptizes Jesus. As if you look at verse 16 in chapter 3, Jesus is baptized and he comes up out of the water. And at the moment that, that happens, heaven was opened and the Spirit of God descends like a dove and like lightning on him. And if that's not enough, there's a voice that comes. It's the Father saying, this is my Son. And when I see him, I am well pleased with my boy. My Son. What an event. What a moment. And then what happens? Scene shift. Whew. Jesus is led by the Spirit into the desert or into the wilderness. This episode this temptation, the testing that takes place here. Scholars have three different ways to kind of interpret and, and place this event into three different categories. Number one, Jesus' testing reminds us of Israel when they were tested in the wilderness. And whatever God commanded Israel in the wilderness, he's now going to require even more of his son, Jesus, the Messiah. Second, Jesus provides a model for tested believers for us to follow. And then lastly, this event is going to give us a better understanding of why Jesus came versus the idea that he came to be this political or military leader, okay? So there's, there's three different kind of categories of scholars kind of look at this episode and interpret this and unpack this. So Matthew emphasizes that Jesus, unlike the nation of Israel, he passed the test here in the desert, here in the wilderness. And Jesus actually quotes from the law of Moses, from the Old Testament, from the book of Deuteronomy. And those commandments, Israel, that nation, they failed to obey them. But Jesus is determined to obey. Okay? So we'll take a look at a couple of lessons here at the conclusion that we can draw from this event in the life of Jesus. We'll look at the example that Jesus shows us so that we can have victory. And also for us to get a, a, better, a better view, a better handle on Jesus' true mission. Why did he come in the first place? Matthew 4, 1 through 11. The Spirit has empowered Jesus for his mission, and, and now the Spirit is the one who leads him into the desert, into this wilderness to be tested. Jesus didn't wander out there on his own. It's like, oh, where am I now? How did I get here? The Spirit is a part of this, okay? The first temptation, verses 2 through 4. He's been fasting 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry. Hello, understatement. Do you have a teenager in your house? How long can they go without food? All right? Jesus is fasting 40 days and 40 nights. The text says he was hungry, and the tempter comes to him and says, if you're the son of God, here's what you could do. See those stones? Tell them to become bread. Here's the thing. The devil is not confused on who he is talking with. A better translation would be, since you are the son of God, the devil isn't so much trying to get Jesus to deny that he's God's son, but because that he is in that place, the devil wants him to act according to what the world would expect of someone who's got this kind of power. 
who's got this kind of identity. Make no mistake about it, Satan knows who he's dealing with. He knows. So this first temptation revolves around food. Good tactic here. I mean, hello, 40 days, 40 nights without food. Jesus is hungry. And this is a test of Jesus' dependence on whether or not he's going to trust in the Father, his Father provide to provide for his everyday needs, to provide for this particular situation. Satan tempts Jesus to make his own manna instead of trusting that his Father is going to come through in this situation. Now, here's the thing. Jesus was not a magician, okay? There's no hocus-pocus type of thing going on here. Magicians during this time period, they would manipulate spiritual power in different formulas. But Jesus acted from an intimate, obedient, personal relationship with his Father. That's where Jesus is acting from with his first temptation. How does he respond? Jesus quotes from the book of Deuteronomy, from the Old Testament law. From the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Be careful, Moses is telling the people as God speaks to him, be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land that the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers. Remember, think about this, how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart whether or not you would keep his commands he humbled you causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna which neither you nor your fathers had known to teach you that here we go man does not live on bread alone but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord wow Moses reminds the people of Israel that it was God who provided this manna in the wilderness. God has led you all the way and he has humbled you and he's testing you and there's a purpose in this. There's a purpose in this. The people are being reminded that the purpose of the manna was to test the people's heart devotion to God. The, the Israelites here had to simply depend on God's provision because there was nothing around. They're in the wilderness. They're in the desert. There's no food for them. And Jesus accepts his father's call to the wilderness and he waits for his father to act. And keep in mind, Jesus had the power to make the stones become bread. Remember feeding the 5,000? Yeah, Jesus had the power, but he didn't act on it. Jesus didn't get selfish in his hunger and say, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to depend on the Father. Jesus said, no, I will wait. I will wait. The second temptation that we find here, verses 5 through 6, round 2. Here we go. The devil took him to the holy city and he had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, or again, since you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it's written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. So this, this test, this temptation is in the area of safety. Satan is hoping to tempt Jesus into trying or testing the power and the ability of his Father. Okay? And if Jesus gives in to this temptation, what's that going to say about him, about Jesus? Jesus would have displayed a complete lack of faith in the power of his heavenly father. The devil wants Jesus to presume on that relationship that he has with God. And so it's kind of a switch out here. You have to be really careful with this. Satan says, hey, you know, Act as if, Jesus, God's there to serve you in this moment. Versus Jesus coming, knowing that he came to serve the Father. Satan says, flip it around. Have God wait on you. Do it. Do it. 
if you're the son of God, jump off because, hey, God, he'll send his angels to catch you, right? And Jesus says in his response, do not test the Lord your God. And Jesus, again, referring back to Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 13 through 16, where God speaks to the nation saying, to them. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God, and his anger will burn against you, and he will destroy you from the face of the land. Do not test the Lord your God as you did at Massah. Now, Massah, what is this test? What is Jesus talking about as he responds to this second temptation. If you take the time today in Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, and read through this passage, you've got this whole Israelite community. They're out in the desert. They're traveling from place to place. And at one point, they come up to Moses and they say, give us some water to drink. We are thirsty. And Moses says, why are you quarreling with me? Why are you doing this? Why are you testing God in our situation right now? And the people are thirsty and they keep grumbling. And they say, why did you bring us out here? We were in Egypt. Hey, we had food. We had water. We knew when those meals and those beverages were coming. We're out here. We don't know what's going to happen. We are scared. And I'm thinking about families and fathers with their kids. And they're quarreling with Moses. Why do we come out here to die? And Moses cried out to the Lord, Lord, what am I to do with these people? They're ready to stone me. And the Lord said, walk ahead, take with you some elders, take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile. Go to that rock and strike it, and water is going to come out. And so that place was called Massah because there they tested the Lord saying, is God here or not? You ever ask God that question? God, are you here or not? Hello? Jesus is tested here by the devil in the second temptation. And this test is is a means to make Jesus put his father to the test by jumping off. If I do it, he'll catch me, right? But Jesus correctly puts this situation in the right context. When Jesus warns of putting God to the test, he's referring to Israel because they were unsatisfied in the desert. We're thirsty. We don't want to be here. Maybe God can't be trusted. We are unhappy, frankly, with God in our situation. Their complaint wasn't really to Moses. You know who they were really complaining against? God. That was really the source of their frustration and the test. And today we need to be really careful that we don't become so arrogant that we think that we have God kind of figured out and in this box. Well, if I do this, I know that then God is going to do this on my behalf. I've seen Christian leaders and I've read stories about Christian leaders who claim a blessing is yours as long as you equals you'll get this. I've seen people get hurt tremendously with that at times. Finally, the third temptation. Round three, okay? We have the final round here as we go back to Matthew chapter four. So now verses eight and nine. Again, (laughs) the devil took him to a very high mountain and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. Just think about what would that look like? for a moment. All this I'm going to give you, the devil said, but there's a condition. If you'll bow down and you'll worship me. So we've got this final temptation. It's all about power and it's all about wealth. It's a temptation to kind of short circuit, to to switch out God's plan for Jesus coming in the first place. And and, and Jesus came to suffer and to go to a cross. 
and to die. Now in a few weeks we're going to celebrate the tomb that is empty, okay? That celebration is still coming. Satan here is offering Jesus this immediate glory and riches, but God's plan is going to take Jesus down this path that has nothing to do with getting the wealth and the glory and the power here on earth. Absolutely nothing at all to do with that. The devil offered Jesus the kingdom without the cross. Think about that in this moment. The devil is tempting and testing Jesus. Have the kingdom. Have them all. Skip the cross. Skip the pain. Skip the suffering. Come on. It can be all yours. If you bow down. And if you worship me. Jesus' response, Deuteronomy 6.13. Fear the Lord your God, serve him only, and take your oaths in his name. In John 18.36, Jesus said this. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight right now. There would be a battle, a war taking place right here. If my kingdom was here. But it's not. My kingdom, Jesus said, it's from another place. It's from another place. Jesus hadn't come to overthrow the Roman Empire. He didn't come to be an earthly king. He didn't come to find the throne so he could sit on it and rule. Okay? And the Jewish people were looking for that guy. But Jesus, it just wasn't adding up. The more he starts to talk and the more they see him living his life, they're going, wait, what's going on? Jesus did come to bring deliverance, but not in the way that they had imagined. They couldn't figure it out. They couldn't figure it out. A couple things to apply to our lives as we work to a conclusion. We've looked at the episode, but then it's kind of like, well, so what? How's that apply to my life? Couple things, couple things. We can see Jesus using the power and the reliability of scripture in his testing that takes place. Jesus submits himself to the claims of Scripture. In all three of these responses to these temptations, Jesus says, it is written. It is written. Jesus uses Scripture. Note the difference here. Jesus uses Scripture to teach the devil what is God's will. The devil quotes Scripture instead to put a promise That was never meant to be. Again, how can God work for you? That's what Satan kind of does here with the scripture. And remember in the first temptation, again, this is how Jesus pushes back. It is written. And the challenge is and the struggle is we need to feed on God's word in the same way that, hello, when we get hungry, we look for food, right? It just comes natural when we're physically hungry. We are looking for something to eat. Jesus says, you know what you really need to rely on that's even more nourishing than food? It's it's that spiritual hunger. If you don't feast on my word, you will be, you will be constantly hungry. You will constantly wonder, "What, what am I missing? It is written. And then the second thing is this. God's calling must be tested. Uh, Matthew is making it very clear that Jesus was led by the Spirit to be tested. And maybe God is calling you and he's going to empower you to do something for him. But you know what? There might need to be a test. And I don't know what that test will look like because the test God may lead you into. It's, it's to build faith. It's to build trust. It's to prepare you for whatever this calling is. The devil, if you flip that around, he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants to make sure you don't even put one foot towards that calling. That's his intentions when it comes to what the devil's trying to do. When we're tested and we get to the other side, Here's the, here's the challenge. We don't want to boast in how great we are. We don't want to boast in our power. We want to remember this, that in the life of Jesus, only after the Holy Spirit came down was Jesus then ready to move into his public ministry. 
He had to be in the wilderness. He had to be in the desert before he could move forward. In the fall of 2010, I was serving in a church in leadership, and there was a meeting one night, and I went to try to open the door, and they were still talking, and the door was locked. And the senior pastor said, we're not quite finished. We'll come and grab you in just a few minutes. And then they did, and they sat me down. They said, the position that you're in, you'll no longer be serving in. I had no clue that this was coming. And I go home to tell my wife, and we're both standing there going, what's going on? We were in the desert. Uh, We were in the wilderness. I won't get into all the details up here in this pulpit concerning that period of time. But we were given a book by an author named Jeff Mannion. He's a pastor at a church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And the book is called The Land Between Finding God in Difficult Transitions. And a friend of Christine and ours gave us this book to read. This is a, just a few lines from this book. And think about Jesus being led by the Spirit into the desert. The testing. And maybe you feel like you're in a wilderness time. There's some testing going on. I don't know where you're at, but this is what the, this author put in one part of the book. The land between, or this desert time, or wilderness time, is what provides the climate for transformational growth. When stripped of financial security, when we are adrift in suffocating grief, when our bodies weaken, or when key relationships evaporate, we have entered a land where the soil is perfect for deep, lasting transformation. The land between is fertile ground for transformational growth. But be warned, the land between is also the place where faith can go to die. Wow. Remember the Israelites, transformational growth is not automatic. We can just as well emerge from the desert or the wilderness with an embittered heart, a resentful spirit, and badly eroded trust as we can have experienced instead transformational growth. And he ends the paragraph with these four words. We get to decide. Wow. Yes. There is going to be a test. It was true in the life of Jesus. It will be true in our lives as well. God at times is going to bring you into a a wilderness experience, kind of a desert season, so that your faith can grow. And God may have a calling on you now, but first, you need to be prepared. You're not ready to walk into it yet. Let Him prepare you. And we follow the example of Jesus who relied on the Word of God to overcome. And Jesus knew the weight of His calling and Jesus knew that there has to be a preparation for me from my Father before I could put my hands and my feet to the call. What about you? Are you relying on His Word when the trial, when the test, when you're in that wilderness season, if you're there now, do you know what He has told you, what He's promised you to help you, to help us? It's here. It's here for us. And whatever God's called you to, you might first need to have a a season of preparation before that door is completely opened. If God needed to do this in His own son's life, And then, if you notice that the angels came and attended him, and then Jesus began to go out and preach. He was ready. I pray that it's true of us as well, as his sons and daughters. Let's pray. Father, this event, this episode in the life of Jesus, this temptation, this testing, this confrontation, wow, powerful moment. And to see your son rely on your word to see him through and to see Jesus know who he is and why he had come and the calling was was a big one and so Lord he knew that he needed to be ready before he could go into that that call so Lord I pray that we can lay this story over our lives I pray that all of us here if we're being tested if we we feel like we're in this wilderness time 
Lord, may we rely upon your word to see us through. Your promises are there. They cannot be revoked no matter what the devil puts in our way. And, and maybe, Lord, someone in here is being called to a new season of, of being used by you. And there may need to be a time of preparation before they can completely step into it. I pray, Lord, they'll stay patient and that their trust will grow. If they're in a land between phase of life, let the soil that they're standing on be rich. And may growth come. Holy Spirit, help us to model what Jesus did when the test came. Father, I pray that for all of us here today as we move forward. Lord, I pray your blessing upon each and every one. May we, may we be used by you in our work, in our city, and in our homes, and our schools. May we pass the test and know what our calling is. I ask this blessing upon each and every one in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit today. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.